Good morning, brothers and sisters. I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both you who are in the sanctuary and those of you joining us online. You know, the last time I was here, I jumped on the platform and a song was in my heart that said, I woke up this morning feeling fine. I woke up with heaven on my mind. Well, you know, I didn't wake up like that this morning. I, this morning I woke up feeling really down and out. And it was particularly daunting, just the thought that I am going to speak to you here this morning. Now, let me tell you, you must have your quiet times in the morning. You have to find God every morning, you know. It makes a difference. So I went to my quiet time, and it, it wasn't the passage that I was doing. It was a passage in Job, but they made a reference to Psalm 139, and I turned there, and oh, the Lord spoke to me. The Psalm says, Lord, you know me. You know my sitting down. You know my rising up. You know my thoughts are far off. You're acquainted with all my ways. You hem me in before and behind and you lay your hands upon me. And he says, such knowledge is so wonderful, I can't comprehend it. Oh, when I saw that and heard that, I said, Lord, I'm all right, you know? I'm all right. <laughs> and then he told me another thing. He says, this morning you don't have to preach, you know? I was quite happy to hear that. He says, all you have to do, I just want you to quietly Share, share some thoughts and, and some scriptures so that my people can have the right mindset and the right perspective about certain things. And I'm very thankful for that. I want to remind you that our church, church's theme for this year is Kingdom Manifestation Now, the heavenly minded cross-carrying, radical believer. And much of our messages on a Sunday morning has been in keeping, in keeping with that theme. A few months ago when I spoke, I spoke on the, uh, the first part of that theme that says the heavenly-minded believer, and we were reminded that heaven is for real. Heaven is for real. And we must not let the hustle and bustle of life and making a living sort of blind us to the reality of heaven. I even said I'm hearing less and less songs being spoken about heaven. But we have to remember that heaven is our ultimate goal and our final destination for those of us who have been redeemed through faith in Jesus Christ. I think about heaven even more and more because in recent years, there are so many of my friends, good friends, close friends in my age group who have passed on, right? And I'm saying, boy, it must be more, must be more than this. So one of my favorite songs that is that my, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And so this morning, I want to share with you on the subject, as we'll see on our first slide, Heavenly citizenship. Heavenly citizenship, right? And our next slide will show our text for this morning, which is Philippians 3 and verse 20. And it says, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we wait as, await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how it's written in the English Standard Version. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul was writing this letter to the Philippians. I'm told that Philipp Philippi is a city about 700 miles from Rome, but it was a Roman colony. In the first century, to be a Roman citizen, was a privilege and a prized opportunity. Here why, as a Roman citizen, 
You could seek exemption from military service. You had the right to hold political office, the right to inherit property, to have protection while traveling throughout the Roman Empire, protection anywhere that is under Roman law, and exemption from certain types of punishment. The Philippians took great pride in their Roman citizenship. Most of the citizens of Philippi spoke Latin as they did in Rome and not the Greek that the people in that region usually speak. The people sort of clothed themselves in Roman apparel and did everything they could to be like Rome. They knew what it was like to live in one country while being a citizen of another country. And so the Apostle Paul knew this, and he used this concept of citizenship to draw their attention and to teach them a very strong biblical truth that Christians, as Christians, their citizenship is in heaven. Paul was telling them that they had a citizenship that is much greater, immensely higher, than Roman citizenship. They had a citizenship in heaven. This morning I want to talk to you about your true citizenship. My brothers and sisters, our citizenship is citizenship is in heaven. Today God wants to be emphatic, us to be emphatically reminded that this world is not our home. God wants us to remind us to be reminded over and over again that the short time we have on planet Earth is not our permanent location, right? It's not our permanent location, and he doesn't want us to feel this way or believe this way, right? It's not our permanent location. We have, if, we have, if we have received Jesus Christ as Savior, Colossians 1.13 says that we have been delivered from the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. We have been relocated. We have been relocated. We have become citizens of heaven on temporary assignment on earth. Let me say that again. We have become citizens of heaven on temporary assignment on earth. In a true sense, Christians are sort of resident aliens on earth. And if we miss this truth as Christians, we are missing something big, something big, big, big. And so this morning I want to share with you what is shown in our next slide, the three R's of heavenly citizenship. The three R's of heavenly citizenship. The Lord is wonderful, you know, when I thought, you know, I put this thing about citizenship in my heart, and I say, how, how do I preach this? How do I say this? And I just, saw, I just saw the three R's in front of me, like a vision, you know? The three R's of citizenship. It's simple, it makes it plain, but here goes. The first R, which is the next slide, is redemption. Redemption. That is how we became citizens of heaven. It's through redemption. Redemption purchased our passport for heavenly citizenship. And when I talk about redemption, man, I, I boy, my, my hair stand up, right? The next slide says, that's 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 to 19. It says, but you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. The next slide says it again. That's in now in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated or conveyed us into the kingdom of his son, if their son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. You know, February of this year makes 61 years 
of my redemption experience. Hmm? Yeah. And I must testify that I have never lost sight of the wonder of it all. I have never lost sight of in absolute amazement, absolute joy. It has been a source of my continuous joy just to think that I have been redeemed and what it means. And I, I have a lot of gospel songs from those days that are just speaks of redemption, you know. One of my favorite is redeemed, or I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed by his infinite mercies, his child and forever, I am. One says, I have a song I love to sing since I have been redeemed. Of my Redeemer, Savior, King, since I have been redeemed. I have a heaven prepared for me since I have been redeemed. Where I shall dwell eternally since I have been redeemed. Man, that is joyful. Very, very joyful. Don't forget it, because after you've been saved and following the Lord for a, lot, a long time, sometimes the, the, the wonder, excitement, and awe of it all, at all, of it all becomes lost on you. I beg you, don't, don't let it become lost on you. Uh, back in the days when Billy Graham was evangelizing the world, I grew up in those days, he had a singer called George Beverly Shea. And he sang a song which I, I never forget the words thereof. Because he was singing up in heaven. And if you read your Bible, you'll find that the redeemed make the most noise up there, right? We don't know redeemed man to say they sing a new song. That him who has loved us and washed us in his blood and has redeemed us from every tribe and nation and people, right? Is the redeemed up there. So this song has words that say there is singing up in heaven such as we have never known, where the angels sing the story of the Lamb upon the throne. Their sweet harps are ever tuneful, and their voices always clear. If only we could be more like them as we serve the Master here. But the chorus says, holy, holy is what the angels sing. And I expect to help them make the courts of heaven ring. But when I sing redemption story, angels fold their wings. For angels never felt the joy that our salvation brings. Yeah. Oh. We need to be very aware of what took place and the tremendous happenings that took place when we were redeemed. The next slide, let us look at some of them, right? Redemption, what does it mean? One, we are passed from death to life. From death to life. Ephesians 2 verse 1 says, And you have he made alive who were dead in trespasses and in sin. We, it says also that we have passed from darkness to light. You know? Ephesians 5 is, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. I wonder if you realize that it's stark contrast. You know? Like the east is from the, there's you no know, middle ground in between. You know? Sometimes people don't know if a thing is black or if it's gray. So they give, it's, a, it's kind of charcoal, you know, charcoal. No, 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 charcoal here. It's two extremes, right? Right? You, you, you are talking about death and life. You are talking about darkness and light. And it goes on to say that we are passed from the power of Satan to God. Because Acts 26 and verse 18 says, To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan unto God. And guess what? We have passed from poor to rich, from the poverty of spirit to the riches of Christ. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 says, The Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that we through his poverty might be rich. 
That's salvation, that's redemption, right? Stark contrast, right? We're talking from righteousness to unrighteousness. Yeah? No in-between business, no charcoal. From righteousness to unrighteousness. Other way around. See, you're listening. From unrighteousness to righteousness. Let me say it again if you never hear it right. From unrighteousness to righteousness. And what it says here, 1 Peter 3 verse 18, For Christ has suffered for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. And if you have the King James Version, it says, He suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. We're talking from sinner to saint. Sinner to saint. You're not half saved, right? Or half sinner. Contrast completely. It moves us from sinner to saint. From sinner to saint. And what it is saying here, uh, first or second Corinthians 5 verse 21. And God made him, that's Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might be made the righteousness of God. And it also takes us from slavery to freedom, from slavery to freedom. Romans 6 and verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be destroyed so that we no longer be enslaved to sin. No longer a slave of sin, I am a child of God. No halfway, no, no, I could go on and on on this contrast, you know, but I told them we would finish by three o'clock today, so I need to just stop here, right? My brothers and sisters, we have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. This was an awesome price paid for our heavenly citizenship. Reflect on your redemption. Rejoice in your redemption. And you, the redeemed, must rejoice. Psalm 107 verse 4 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. So never lose the excitement and the joy of your redemption. And when things look rough and rocky in life, remember where he brought you from. Remember your redemption. Amen. Now the second slide, or the slide seven, the next slide, it speaks of the second R, our rights and privileges. Our rights and privileges. Citizens always, or citizenship always comes with rights and privileges. Paul was a Roman citizen. We found that in Acts 22 and verse 28. And he benefited from his citizenship in many ways. Paul did not hesitate to use his Roman citizenship when he had the right to appeal to Caesar. He appealed to Caesar because he had that right as a Roman citizen. He used his citizenship as protection from a vigilante mob. And we find that in Acts 22, verses 25 to 29. He used it again to obtain release from the tension. That's in Acts 16, verses 37 to 39. However, he used it as a tool. It wasn't an identity maker. He used it as a tool. He used his Roman rights and privileges to enhance his Christian mission throughout the empire. So Paul no, he was a citizen of Rome, and he had rights as a citizen of Rome, and therefore he used those rights. Our heavenly citizenship comes with rights and privileges. Rights and privileges. So let us look at some of them. We have a right and a privilege is that we have now an elevated status. An elevated status. Ephesians 2 and verse 19 says, says no, therefore, no, therefore, we are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You need to know these things, you know. It must sink deep into your spirit as to who you are 
and where you have, what you have, you have got from the Lord, right? Ephesians 2 verse 6, and God has raised us up together and made us sit together um, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and elevated status. We should know and be aware of who we are in Christ and the status into which we have been conveyed. We are now fellow citizens of the ship, with the saints and we are now of the household of God. You are now a child of God. You know? And you must walk about realizing this. King's kid, as one person says, you are a child of God. All right? Galatians 4, verses 4 to 5. In the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a woman, to redeem us who were under the law so that we can receive the adoption of sons, a child of the king. John 1 verse 12, when I got saved, this was the verse that the counselor used. But as many as received him, to them gave he the right or the privilege to become the sons of God, even to them who believe on his name. And John, 1 John chapter 3 verse 2 says, Beloved, now we are the sons of God. And then we are joint heirs with Christ. Joint heirs with Christ. Romans 8 and verse 17 says, Now if we are children, then we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. You realize how much rights and privileges that give you? Eh? Sometimes we're not, we're not conscious of it and we live in a very mundane experience and don't realize where we are and what we have. Galatians 4 and verse Say, and verse 7 says, We are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you an, an heir. Yes, uh, I'm just going to quote something that I picked up from something Joel Austin wrote. He wrote this. He says, Know who you are in Christ Jesus. He said, it's a tragedy to go through life as a child of the king in God's eyes, yet live as a lowly pauper in your own eyes. He said, my brothers and sisters, we should not settle for mediocrity when we are children of the king of kings. If you do not know your rights and privileges, we will not find true purpose for our lives we will live a life of self-imposed spiritual poverty. Know who you are in, in Christ Jesus. Know your rights and your privileges. Another one is that our name is written in the book of life. Our name is written in heaven. Hmm? Have you thought of that? Your name is there if you are a believer. Uh, Revelation 21 and verse 27 says, Speaking of heaven, he said, nothing unclean will enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful and deceitful, but those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. They are the ones. It goes on in chapter 20, verse 15, says, anyone, anyone who was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. You know, most countries, they, to be a citizen, you have to meet certain legal requirement, requirements. But as a citizen, you are granted rights and privileges, and each country has a record of its citizens. Almost every country has a record of its citizens. Heaven also has a record of its citizens, and only those who are on that record can enter. The Gospel of Luke tells us a story. The disciples were out on a mission, and they came back rejoicing, man. They were, they were, they were very, very glad. They said, Lord, we found that even devils, the demons, were subject to us in your name, and they were very happy. I know what the Lord Jesus said to them. Do not rejoice that demons are subjected to you. Rather rejoice that your name is written in heaven. That's a cause for rejoicing. A big, big thing, right? 
So if your name not down here, you're all right. If you're a Christian, you have my name up there. Brothers and sisters, as heavenly citizens, our, our names are written in heaven's records. The privilege is great, and the rejoicing should be great also. Amen? Amen. Then we have entrance. Yeah, entrance into the presence of God. Hebrews 10, 19 to 20. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Let us therefore draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Hebrews, or rather Ephesians 2 and verse 12, it says, in whom have boldness and confidence access, access rather through faith in him. Let me say that again. In whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. And Ephesians 2 and verse 18, for through him, that is Jesus, we have access to the Father by one spirit. You know, in the Old Testament, God was very selective as to who can approach him and how they can approach him. You know, just this past Friday, one of my agents who is a believer, she came into my office and she said, Winston are doing a Bible study in Leviticus and Numbers. And he said, to approach God them days is a holy parigma role. You know, that was her words. Of course, you mean rituals and sacrifices and procedures. A very complex thing. And you, you, you read Leviticus and Numbers and you realize what it took those days to be in the presence of the Lord. Eh? But today, because Jesus' blood was shed and because he died, as Christians we can enter into the most holy place. Jesus has opened for heavenly citizens a new and a living way. Access, access given through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So as citizens of heaven, we have access to God anytime. Hmm? Thank God there's no more restrictions, no more limits, and no more intermediaries. Hmm? Praise God. Then we are partakers of God's promises. Partakers of God's promises. The next slide tells us this. That's 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. Whereby, it says, whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. Let me read it again. Whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. The word, the word of God is filled with exceedingly great and precious promises on which we as citizens of the kingdom can lean and which we can claim as heavenly citizens. Beloved, let us appreciate, let us cherish these rights and these benefits. I'm coming to the third R of heavenly citizenship. We have often heard it said that with every privilege comes what? Our responsibility. I hear that from, um, from school days. You know, I heard that from prep school, you know? Or uh, what do them do? call it them days here? Um, forget the name now. But you heard that, that with every privilege comes a responsibility, a responsibility. This is also true, and it's true of us heavenly citizens. We saw where we were given the right and privilege to enter into the presence of God, into the very throne room of God. This comes with a responsibility to offer up worship and praise to him. We go right in there. And if you're in there, we should be giving worship and praise more and more. 
it comes with a responsibility to pray and to intercede, right? So when you go before God and you are into his presence, you have a responsibility, responsibility to pray, pray for your family, pray for your leaders, pray for your government, pray for the nation, pray for fellow believers, pray for non-believers. We have a responsibility to utilize, if I should put it that way, the throne room of God. He says, come and make your petitions known to me. So we should be praying more and more and more. Our prayer life should be what the scriptures call praying without ceasing. We should be there on a regular basis. We have a responsibility. We saw where we became citizens through redemption with the blood of Jesus Christ. With this privilege and with this right comes the responsibility of sharing the good news of the gospel with others, right? It comes with that responsibility. And I just want to just say it here, that you must share the gospel with your colleagues, with your friends, with your relatives. Sometimes you don't know what, what happens, you know. You don't know, you don't see anything happen, and you go away feeling that nothing happened. Let us mention a few examples. Uh, I was, this was in the late 1990s, I was having a one-to-one -one session with an agent, or mid-1990s. And a friend of, of mine, Uriel Salmon, and you know our church have a Uriel Salmon room, Uriel Salmon, he called me, and I was talking to him on the phone. And when I hung up the phone, this agent said, excuse me, Mr. Bennett, is that Mr. Uriel Salmon? And I said, yes. He said, I should tell you something about Mr. Salmon, you know. I said, what's that? He said, Mr. B., I had migraine in a bad, 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 bad way. Bad, bad. When I get migraine, I can't do anything. And he was a lecturer at the university. We were doing a cost accounting class. And I had one of the worst attacks of migraine. So when the class was finished, I couldn't walk. I couldn't move. I just put my head on the desk and hope it will wear off. Mr. Salmon approached me and he said, are you feeling okay? And I told him how I was feeling. And then he said, do you, do you mind if I pray for you? And she said, no. No, Mr. Salmon, no ex ex uh, exercise is God-given rights and privileges here, no. She said he put his hand in my forehead like this and prayed for me and prayed for my migraine. She said, Winston, that's about eight or nine years ago. I have never had another attack of migraine. I said, Mr. Salmon, no. She said, no, I don't know. I said, I'm going to tell him no. She said, all right, do that. So you never know. You never know, right? You know, they, they say God's words is like a hammer. You have heard me use this analogy already. God's words is like a hammer that breaks the rocks in twain. But take anybody that breaks rocks with a hammer and ask them which blow break the hammer. Which blow break the hammer? Right? He probably broke at the fifth blow. But it broke at the fifth blow because there was a first blow, there was a second, third, and fourth, and it broke at the fifth. So when you proclaim the word of God, you don't know what blow you are giving. It could be the third, could be the first, but a word is like a hammer and it will do its job. Let me, let me share an, another thing here. Boy, if I, I, if I have to finish by three, I, I can't go on sharing, right? But what, what happened years ago, Don and myself visited one of the missionary churches, right? We were just visiting. I can't remember why we visited. But while I was there, I saw a classmate of mine from high school. And when I saw him there, I said, what? What him doing in church? <laughs> Sorry to say that. I look, and he is in church because I know that guy. I know that guy. And when they were preaching and praying, may I pray for him, may I pray for him, and I look through one eye, you know, if I'm responding, never see any response, right? But after church, I, I met him, I greeted him, I introduced my wife to him and that. And he turned to Dawn and said, Mrs. Bennett, I need to tell you about my husband. He used to preach to me at school, you know, he used to preach to me at school, and I give him a hard time, a hard time. But you know, when the gospel was presented to me, clearly, I remember that this is exactly what Winston used to tell me. And that was like a confirmation. And I said, look at that. From school days, 
And he could say what I shared with him when he heard the gospel again. That was the final blow. My first blow, or second blow, right? Made a difference, made a big difference. So share the gospel is one of our responsibilities. It's one of the responsibilities. And there are many, many responsibilities. But I'm going to jump to the next slide, which is slide nine, All right? Slide nine. And that is quoting a verse from Philippians 1 and verse 27. He says, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducted in a manner worthy of the good news of Christ. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. He starts the verse by saying, above all. It means of all the responsibilities that we have, above all. Hmm? He says that as a sort of attention getter. He's saying, listen very carefully. He's saying, pay attention now. This is about the most important thing about heavenly citizenship. This, this statement gives a sort of perspective through which we can understand our entire reason for being still here on earth. This statement is a truth that must shine in every corner of our existence as Christians. It is calling us to a radical, countercultural way of living. It engages the culture of this world from a different frame of reference. I wrote that down because I didn't want to miss it. Let me read it again. This statement, this above all statement, he says that it, this statement is a truth that must shine in every corner of our existence. It is calling us to a radical, countercultural way of living that engages the culture of this world from a different frame of reference. Because we are citizens of heaven, our behavior, our way of living must be governed by the laws of God, by heavenly laws. Conducting ourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. And here are some of the behaviors that will make us worthy of the good news about Christ. And the next slide starts with it. Here are some of the behaviors. That's Colossians 3 and verse 5. What it says there. It's Colossians 3 and verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. This is our old way of living before we were redeemed. In order to behave as worthy, heavenly citizens, we must rid ourselves of these things. Our new life must honor God. And you know, you, you, it spells it out. And sometimes if we read the scripture, you mustn't gloss over these things. You must look at each one that it says and, and, and sort of examine ourselves and see where we are. How do we match up to this as heavenly citizens? Verses 8 to 9 goes on to say, Rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips, do not lie to each other. This is how we must relate to each other by putting to death all that demeans other people. And we must have a good look at these verses, right? Spell it out. Don't just gloss over it. Examine ourselves with respect to each sin that is listed there. Examine ourselves as to how we measure up as heavenly citizens. Thank the Lord that the Holy Spirit will convict us as we search his word and also will help us towards righteous living. And you know, there's a little story about that. They said there were three or four church deacons who were in a little prayer meeting, just the four of them, in this room, locked away. And they were wanted to be open to each other, you know. They were trying to share uh, 
some of the things that is plaguing them and want the brothers to pay, pray for them and, you know, so that they can get deliverance from it, right? One guy, the first deacon, him said, boy, gentlemen, confidentially, my, my problem is, is filthy language. Why, I just cuss, say, you know, particularly if somebody bad drive me on the road, I just let off some piece of language there, you see. And I, sometimes I just don't feel like I can't control it. So I want you all to pray for me. So, okay. The next guy said, my problem, lying. Boy, lying become a, a habit for me. Or lie when there's no need for me to lie. Sometimes I just lie on the lie at all, you know. It's just a problem for me. Problem for me. And... Uh, brothers, I need your prayer. I really need your prayer to get over this problem of lying. The third guy said, well, confidentially, you know, my problem is sexual loss. Lord, give me a hard time, boy. I will tell you, I lost after the girls at my workplace. Boy. Sorry to say, even in church, I lost after some of the sisters, man. I have a real problem with lost gentlemen. I need prayer. I need help. Well, the fourth guy, he said, you know, gentlemen, my problem is slander. It's slander. And I can't wait to get out of this room to tell people about you guys. You know, I hear so them lock the door, you know. <laughs> and they made some serious prayer of deliverance to make sure that he is rid of this problem before him come out again. The next slide. Slide 11. This one says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, um, holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you might grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. You see those things listed? Right? You know how we have been described? We have been described as a chosen people, holy and dearly beloved, Paul is speaking to heavenly citizens, right? Our responsibility is to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. And you, and you listen to that list of things? That's what the scripture told us was the fruit of the Spirit. We have to literally exhibit it in our daily lives. The attributes of a heavenly citizen will be displayed in compassion, in kindness, in humility, in gentleness, in patience, in forgiveness, and most of all, love for each other. Don't gloss over these scriptures. Look at each one of those listed. And as a heavenly citizen, let us examine ourselves. Because above all, as a citizen of the kingdom, this is how we must live. This is how we must behave. This is how we must say it. So, in closing, brothers and sisters, let us be very, very clear. This world is not our home. We are just a passing through. Our true citizen is in heaven. And we are like resident aliens here on earth. Get that perspective. Get that perspective very clear. Don't get to love this earth too much. Right? I mean, I'm 76 now, but some people pass on before then. It's this, this, this very transient, this time here on earth. Our real destination, our ultimate goal is heaven. We've got to be heavenly minded. Huh? We got our citizenship through redemption, through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that made us fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. We are children of God. We are king's kids, so to speak. As children of the Most High God, we are given rights and privileges, but as we sojourn here on earth, we need to exercise these rights and privileges for the kingdom of God's sake. We need to pray and to intercede because we have entrance into the most holy 
God or to the most holy place. We need to bind and loose because that was an authority and a right that was given to us. We need to claim and proclaim. You know, as Christians, we can do that as citizens of the kingdom. We need to evangelize. We need to evangelize. These are all responsibilities that we have as citizens of the kingdom, right? But above all, as Paul said, live as citizens of heaven, conducting ourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. And our final slide says it all. What it says here, it says, whatsoever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father through him. Let us live as heavenly citizens. Bless God.